morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to those who have not been here before, and this is your first Sunday. Welcome to those who have um, come back and returned to worship with us. Good morning to those of you who are at home. We are going to take about 30 seconds to go and do a meet and greet and go and say hi um, to someone maybe you haven't seen before or say hi to an old friend. So ready? One, two, three, go. everybody. Let's go ahead and have a seat. And I have just a couple things before we get started. We just wanted to, um, one, we have communion today. Two, the altars are open for anybody who would like to come down and just, you can bring somebody, you can come by yourself and you can meet Jesus, you can meet God, you can meet the Trinity anywhere you want. The Holy Spirit's already within us. But if there's a burden, if there's a praise, bring it down to the altar. If you cannot go down to the altar um, for any reason or you don't feel comfortable, that's okay too. You can stay in your seat. God is everywhere, right? I thought this was a good devotion since we are doing communion and we want to kind of just cleanse our hearts this morning. This is Ephesians 4:32. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. And thus communion is a good remembrance of what sacrifice he gave us. We also have prayer request cards in the back of your seats. Um, if you need prayer, if you want to praise anything that is on your heart, um, please go ahead and you are more than welcome to share it with our um, past pastoral team as well as our prayer team. We have an excellent prayer warrior um, team that just loves to pray for everybody. Let's go ahead and speaking of prayer, let's pray and get started. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just come to you today and we just want to just lift ourselves to you. We want to just bear our souls to you, Lord Jesus, as we just open up and we want to be in tune with you, Holy Spirit. Lay on our hearts this morning as Pastor Sean comes and shares what you have for us. Thank you for the worship team and just their commitment and their passion for you, Lord. In your son's name, amen. I want to welcome you here to a time of singing and praising God. Some of you will want to stay in your seats as you sing. Others will want to stand. Some will want to kneel. As Stacy mentioned, whatever the Lord is prompting you, just feel free. Feel free to worship God in any way. We're going to start off with just a couple songs. Uh, standing here in your presence, we're going to proclaim to Jesus that he is God and that he is worthy. He is holy. So those of you that want to stand, go ahead and stand now and let us sing to God. Yeah. 
seated. Children, you are released for church. And we just have one announcement this morning. We have, I know that's hard to see, so I apologize, but we um, have a baby shower after, um, later this afternoon actually, at five o'clock for ladies. You are all invited to Stephanie Coates' baby shower. Um, Ellen Coates, if you know Ellen, that is her daughter, and Ellen is extremely, extremely happy because she has another new little grandchild. Um, and so please come. It's at 5 o'clock. The invitations are out there on the podium. Um, ushers, do you want to go ahead and come up, and we'll do offering. Hmm, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to just continue our worship um, Part of giving um, finances is worshiping, Lord Jesus. We want to give all to you because it is all yours to begin with. And we just ask for blessings this morning over our giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, let me try the good morning part again. Good morning. good morning. Friends, there you go. I welcome those of you that are online with us as well. The Lord bless you. 
We're going to uh, continue in our worship of the Lord. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do is um, commit ourselves to some intentional prayer. It's okay to do that, isn't it? Okay, good. I was wondering. Um, no, it's church, and we want to commit ourselves to intentional prayer. There's a couple things I want to draw to your attention. First, uh, Amber just told me about her little boy, Asher. Asher is four. Four. Uh, usually, if you ask the little ones how old they are, they'll tell you the year and the month and the day. But we're just going to go with four. Asher's four. And he has surgery on his ear coming up Monday, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask if you would just agree with me. Let's seek the one who gives healing. Uh, it, it's not any man or woman that confers healing. It's the Lord that heals, but we can seek him for that. And so we want to do that together. If you would be willing to agree with me in a spirit of prayer, and really it could be yes, Lord, and amen. Uh, would you pray with me? Lord, we're just going to bring to you little Asher. We thank you that he's safe, but we ask that you'd give him healing through this surgery. We pray that you would give him the ability to hear well, be free of pain. And Lord, we, we want to ask for something beyond that. We want to ask for spiritual hearing for Asher, that he would be able to hear you when you're communicating with him as a little boy and as he grows into a man, would you speak to Asher in ways that he can understand you? Lord, we pray you'd minister to this little boy, your beloved Asher, in mind and body and spirit. And we ask for this blessing in faith in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And uh, Willie and Jackie, Jackie, could I, and Willie, come on up here. Um, this is Willie and Jackie Foster, and um, uh, the re yeah, okay, all right. They're going to a uh, fundraiser that must have something to do with the way you're dressed, so that's, I'm jealous now. Um, Jackie is having a very, very ser serious back surgery um, tomorrow? Monday tomorrow. And Monday and Tuesday. That's that more than one surgery. And the recovery is going to be three to six months? A long time. And so uh, they asked if we would be willing to pray with them. And again, I've already, uh, how we approach the Lord is in faith. And um, in the epistle of James, he says, are there any among you that are sick? If so, call the elders and they'll anoint with oil and lay hands on and pray and ask God for healing. And again, I would say there's no magic in oil, right? There's, there's no magic in the laying on of hands. It, what it does is it, it's to be a symbol of what the Lord does when he comes upon us to bring physical, spiritual, and emotional healing. And he does all of those. But in this case, we're going to ask that the Lord would bless you in this surgery and in your recovery. And I have some oil. I'd like to anoint you. And I ask you again, if you would be willing, if you're able to agree with me uh, in faith in Christ for this healing. Jackie, I anoint you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, with the laying on of hands, we ask that you would bring healing through the surgery and through the recovery. We pray that you would strengthen Jackie in her body, in her mind, and encourage her spirit. Lord, you said that you would not abandon us, that you would be with us. So we call upon you by your name, Emmanuel, God with us. And we ask in faith in you, Jesus, the healer, would you bless our sister, our friend, Jackie? We'll give you all of the glory and all of the honor because it's all due to you. And the church said, amen. 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 Thank you. Yeah, the Lord bless you. Okay, we'll you, keep you. You might not recognize her the next time she comes back because she'll be two inches taller because of all the titanium rods in her back from her pelvis up to her upper Okay. Back. So if she's taller, that's why. Well, she can stand down here and you can stand on the top step if that's an issue for you.
It's all worship when we gather together, the remembering of Jesus. It's not just a song. It's not just in the times of offering or the times of prayer. It's, it's in the corporate gathering that the church can worship. Now, the Lord goes with us wherever we're at. And this is the mystery, isn't it? That the Lord would say, I'm not just going to be among you, but I'm going to bring a new covenant and a new way, and I will be in you. And the way that that happens is that for any that follow the Lord Jesus, any that surrender their lives to him by faith, he gives them the Holy Spirit as a seal and a promise. And this was really significant to me when I was 16 and 17 years old. Because I, di I didn't think about God except for when I went to church with my family. But I, I made a surrender. I remember there was a time in my life when I made a surrender to him. And it dawned on me later. Oh, I, I don't just go to church to be in his presence. He's in me. And then I had some conviction because... I realized I'd taken the Lord some places that I'm pretty sure he didn't want to go. And I'm pretty sure he didn't want me to go. But I want to say that the Lord is patient and kind. Today I want to talk about good mud. Yeah, let that sink in. Good mud. I want to talk about blindness. Two kinds of blindness. Blindness is the inability in, in the physical realm to perceive or see, at least, with that function, to see the physical world around you. Now, people who are blind have an accentuated sense of hearing and smell, and it makes up for the loss of that, that gift of sight. But sight, it's that ability to see those things in our physical world. That's physical blindness. Spiritual blindness is similar in that it's the inability to see the things that are happening in and around us that are related to the kingdom of God, that are spiritual in nature. And this is a very difficult concept because some people want only what I... Talk to me about what I can see and feel and hear. That's what is known. Talk to me about that. And God created all of that. But he's also spirit. And there's a spirit realm. And spiritual sight is a gift. It can't be earned. Right? If, if you have in your life, been able to perceive who God is, who Jesus is. It's because God has given this gift to you. This protects all of us from being arrogant. Like, oh yeah, I ascended to this knowledge, this ability, because I have, I'm special, I have certain gifts or abilities. No, no. Anyone who sees God, anyone who is able to perceive and see in the spiritual realm, it's because God has given them that gift. So the story that we're going to read is about two kinds of blindness. I'm going to read the story, and then I'd like to unpack it in a different kind of way. Before we read it, let's, let's pray and ask God to speak to us in ways that we can understand. It's okay to ask Him that. God, I take a moment for myself and my friends would you help us to understand what you're saying to us in the word, through the spirit as you speak to us, just spirit to spirit? We know, Lord, that you can speak to us in ways that we can understand. We pray that you'd give us ears to hear and eyes to see and the courage to follow you. And we ask for this in faith in our master Jesus. Amen. So this is a story from John chapter 9. Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he's just recently, very, very recently, been threatened with death 
by that brutal, barbaric form of death, stoning, where people grab rocks and they throw the rocks at you until you're dead. And he was threatened with this kind of death because he had said, I am God. If you'll read in the back part of John chapter 8, you'll see that Jesus speaks out this word, this testimony about himself. And the people who were in charge, the religious leaders of the day, they said that's blasphemy and you should be put to death. So it's in this context, it's, there's agitation. Jesus is walking on a thin line and he's in Jerusalem kind of the headquarters of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders. And he's already got a target on his back. Do you think he's going to lie low? No, my Jesus. Not a chance. So in John 9, when he has a chance to lay low, because he's got a target on his back, he does just the opposite. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it reads like this. Just hang on, sit back. Remember when you were in grade school and you loved having your teacher read to you, right? And if you didn't, then you missed out because that was the, that and recess were my favorite parts of school. So I'm going to just read this story to you. Let the Lord speak to you and take you where he wants as you hear this story. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth meaning the man they discovered, the man had been blind since he'd been born. His disciples, Jesus' disciples, that is, asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There was a pervasive thought during that day that if you had some sort of physical malady, it's be, it was because of sin, either your sin or your parents' sin. That was strongly and widely held. So his disciples say, guys blind, which one of them sinned, him or his parents? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Could we just pause for a moment? If you're blind, what can you do really, really well? Hear. In my family growing up, we called that hawk and a loogie. <laughs> Do you suppose when this guy with heightened abilities to hear heard that sound, he was thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> listen to what happens. Jesus spits on the ground, makes some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I'm the man. Kind of like, you know I can hear you talking about me, right? I'm, I'm the man. Not, I'm the man, but I'm that man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. Pay attention to the word how. And it'll be repeated. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus, made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. 
Where is this man? Remember now, Jesus got a target on his back. Where is this man? They asked. I don't know, he said. I'm not sure what the inflection is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I couldn't see. He left. They brought to the Pharisee the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Okay, so just as a background to to put this into context. The Jews had a book, a commentary on the law that God gave to Moses. They had not just a book, but books. It was called the Mishnah. They had an entire book included in the Mishnah about the law and the practice of the Sabbath. An entire book to say how to keep the Sabbath and how not to break the Sabbath and what was considered breaking the Sabbath. For instance, you could not set a broken bone on the Sabbath unless it was life-threatening. If you've ever had a broken bone, you feel like it's life-threatening. But they had a law on that. Well, if it's broken but you're going to live, we'll take care of it tomorrow, the day after the Sabbath. You could spit. They even wrote in the book about the law, about the Sabbath, that you could actually spit. This qualifies in my book as overthinking, but they had it in there that you could spit. But if your spit rolled, I know this is probably ruining your lunch. I'm sorry, it's in the Bible. But if your spit rolled and caused a little furrow in the ground, that was breaking the Sabbath. Why? Because furrows were what they used to plant. Wow. So, when Jesus spit, that wasn't breaking the Sabbath. When he made mud, that was breaking the Sabbath. What kind of people can't celebrate? He couldn't see, and now he can see. Who, who, who isn't going to celebrate that? People that like policies more than they do people. And you might think, well, Jesus don't like policies. He don't like rules. He don't like the law. No, no, no. He just wants them to square with the Scripture. So that's part of the backdrop. Why would he get in trouble for spitting, making mud, putting it on the guy's eyes, and healing him? It's all because it happened on the Sabbath. And that was dear to them. That was a treasured law and all of the other things they added to what God had done and given. Which is often the case, isn't it, for, for humans? We add to what God gave us and call that the same thing as what God gave us. Now the day on which, verse 14, now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees who asked him how he had received his sight, there's that word again, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. And that's what you see around Jesus. Some receive him and others say, he not the guy. Verse 17, then they turned again to the blind man. They will not leave this guy alone. They turned to the, the man who was blind. He's not blind anymore. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. They still did not believe that he'd been blind and had received sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How? There's that word again. How is it now that he can see? 
We know he's our son. Boy, I bet she was relieved about that. Nobody else could recognize him. We know he's our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Do you believe that? I don't know. I think they'd probably heard too. Maybe they're reporting truthfully, but I don't think they are from what's said later. How can he see? We don't know. Ask him. We've already done that. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who'd already decided that anyone that acknowledges Jesus, that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So this put out isn't just like, uh, you're going to have to leave. You acted inappropriately. The synagogue represented the culture, the life, the family, the vocation. To be put out of the synagogue was to lose almost everything. That's how much of a target Jesus had on his back and his parents did not want to lose that. They were afraid. That that's, fear can cause us to do things that in retrospect looking back when we have safety and provision we would never have done that. Have you ever done something in fear and then later thought why did I do that? I've done that too many times. Why did I do that? But I have another question as I read it. And I, I would recommend to you, take time just day by day to read just a small portion of the Word. Don't try to read the whole thing all at once unless you get a retreat cabin and three months, right? Just read a little bit day by day and see what the Lord begins to prompt you in your thinking. One of the questions that I have is, if this man was born blind and he's begging, what kind of relationship does he have with his parents? What? I don't know. Ask him. He's of age. They're just, maybe they're just taking care of themselves. I'll tell you what. The kind of people that are magnetic are the ones that have outward glances. They're not just all about themselves, but they see the needs and, and try. They try to do something, right? Verse 24, a second time they summoned the man, which I'm sure he was thrilled about, who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, which implies they thought he hadn't told the truth. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. Now, this is what we would call in baseball terms, he's about to talk some smack talk here, okay? Don't miss it. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. By the way, have you ever heard that song, Amazing Grace? It was written by a guy named John Newton who was a captain of, he was a slave trader. He was a captain of a boat that brought thousands of slaves from Africa. He enslaved, transported, and oversaw the death of literally thousands, the ones that didn't make it. John Newton came under deep conviction of the Lord. And, and let me explain the difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is what God uses to draw us to himself. Where we have this sense of, ah, I shouldn't have done that. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't said that. That conviction God uses to draw us to himself so that he can settle it and apply the remedy. Condemnation is what Satan uses to push us under, uh, to, not to get under God's covering, but to cover it up. And condemnation doesn't bring freedom, it brings guilt. 
There's a word that everybody can deal with, right? And understand. Guilt. If you're feeling guilt, condemnation, versus the drawing of God through conviction, listen to the conviction. Move in that direction and get under the covering of God. Right? I was blind, now I see. That scripture right there was what John Newton used as the core of that song, Amazing Grace. I once was blind, but now I see. John Newton was writing about that second kind of sight. Spiritual sight, not physical sight. They asked him again, verse 26, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I told you already. You did not listen. The way I would say it is, are your ears painted on? Because I, I don't think they're real ears. Because they don't seem to be work. I said it, and you're not hearing. I've already said it. He said. That, that would be Sean's smack talk, by the way. Are your ears painted on? You don't have to use that. That probably will get you into a fight. Don't say that. <laughs> I've already told you. You did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Here's the smack talk. Do you want to become his disciples too? Huh. Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are his fellows, you are this fellow's disciple. We are the disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly people who do his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Wow, did this guy go to a uh, seminary? This is good stuff. To this, they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. These are not friendly words. They're not saying it with a nice tone. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Not like, leave this room. They threw him out. That's it. You're no longer part of us. They threw him out. Jesus heard that he'd been thrown out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Now what do you think? When Jesus went and found that guy, the first thing the guy would have recognized is not what Jesus looked like. He would have recognized what he sounded like. He probably would have said, you're not going to spit again, are you? Come good. But Jesus asks him this question, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? He would have understood that that term meant God, the Messiah, the promised one. Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. He addresses him first as sir. But this guy's ready. He's ready. Because he, he says, he calls him Lord. Jesus, he goes, let's see, Lord, I believe in him, and he worshiped. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Now he's referring to a spiritual blindness there. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus should have said, no, I'm sorry, I'll stay with the Jesus said, 
If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. His name is Tyler Michael. Tyler, would you come up here, bud? Tyler is uh, one of the players on uh, the Churchill baseball team. I get to help with that. And uh, we call him T-Mike. So uh, I asked if Tyler would help me make some good mud. No, no, I don't like that laugh. So if you would just pour a, just a little bit of that water, doesn't have to be a lot because we don't want to make good muddy soup. Okay. Let's see, a little more. I'm not sure if this is bark dust or dirt. So that's probably going to be good. I have towels here, and you're wondering, did you ask your wife if you could bring those? I did not. Um, so, but they were in the garage, and you know, if something goes in the garage, it never comes back into the house. All right. So here's soap for you, by the way. You're going to have to clean up yourself. Oh, look at that. Look at a white towel. Isn't that great? Wouldn't you have chosen white as well? Okay, so Tyler, be kind. I promise I will throw better BP if you're kind to me. Get it, get it on there. Playing the part of Jesus today is T. Mike. No, no, it's going to take more. Not on the nose. I can smell. What are you doing? Put, put, go ahead. Get it on there. This is your one and only. Oh, my gosh. That's enough. Okay. That's, okay, you have to take the bowl. Tyler, are you there? Okay, all right. Laugh if you will. You're, once you've cleaned your hands, you mudslinger, you can go back and sit down. Will you say thank you? Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So for just a few moments, I don't know, there's mud all over the place. Sorry, Stacy, or whoever is going to help me clean this up. What would that have felt like? What would it have felt like for that man who was blind to have this in some way done to him? You know, one of the truths is this. Jesus saw that man before that man ever saw Jesus. He, he sought him out. That man wasn't seeking Jesus. Jesus was seeking him, right? And that's the way it is for us. Maybe you don't know that God has been seeking after you from the moment you were born. He knows you. God has seen you and me before we ever had any clue, before we knew what to call him. He saw us. He sees you. He's seeking you. And that might be, that, that may cause you some excitement like, I, I want to be sought after by God. But it, it may cause you a sense of fear like, no, I'm not cleaned up. I got mud all over my face. I got mud in my life. But if you have a sense of what is God going to think of me, keep this in mind. If he didn't want you, he wouldn't be seeking after you. You remember when I asked you to pay attention to the word how? That man was asked, how did he heal you? He got asked that four times. How did he heal you? 
how did he heal you? He tells, how did he heal you? They were asking the wrong question, and so do we. We ask the wrong question. We'll ask the why or the how, but not the who. Who healed you? We can't get the how without the who. You need the who for the how, right? I know it's weird, it sounds weird, but it's true. Here's something to consider. The next time you're quietly talking to God, when that's just between you and Him, and don't think that people don't talk to God if they don't look the right way to you. Most people talk to God, whether they know Him or not. The next time you're having that kind of a God conversation, I want to encourage you to ask this question. Who are you? Who are you? Right? Did you see what happened? Where did Jesus go after he did what T. Mike did to me? He hit the road. He's nowhere to be found. That guy's going through meeting after meeting. Where's Jesus? Don't know. But I do know this. He shows up right after that guy gets kicked out. That's when he shows up. Because you remember what the scripture said? When Jesus heard that he'd been put out, he went and what is the word we read? Found him. He went and found him. Jesus had already given the man physical sight. What was he going to find him for? To give him a different kind of sight. And listen, if you have the gift of physical sight, I want to encourage you, thank God for it. The spring is always a great time. Look at the colors. Give God glory and thanks. Oh God, thank you that I can see. Diane and I usually walk in the mornings through our neighborhood and we see some of the most brilliant colors. I'm so thankful for the gift of physical sight. But there's another sight that God wants to give to us that cannot be earned. It's spiritual sight. And it only comes, interestingly enough, spiritual sight only comes when we surrender to Him and say, I'm done being my own Lord. I surrender to you. Now why would that, why would that be the key, the trigger, the door that opens the way to spiritual insight and sight for us? Because of this, we're no longer depending on ourselves, but we're depending on the one who made us. God does not call us to a life of independence. He calls us to a life of dependence upon Him, to find our life in Him. That's the second sight. That's spiritual sight. That's the kind of sight that Jesus was coming to give to that man. Not just physical sight. Why was this man born blind? Was it his mother or father who sinned? Neither. It was for the glory of God in him. My last thought before we share communion together is this. When Jesus went and found him to bring him in, he'd been kicked out to bring him in. He addressed the man as sir. Do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? Well, you can now see him. He's the one who's speaking to you. Oh, Lord, I believe. I, I want to ask you a question. Which way would you address Jesus today? Would you address him with the very polite and even appropriate title of sir? That gives honor. Or would you address him with the title of Lord? Oh, that, that's a different kind of honor, isn't it? Because that's when we find our life in him. 
He's not just with us, but He's in us and upon us. And that, my friends, is what the Lord is calling each one of us in our lifetime to trust Him. He is trustworthy. Amen? Amen. He is trustworthy. And I invite you, I invite you to consider who Jesus is. Now, this, this, these tables, these communion tables that are set here, what they represent, is, it's a time of remembrance for remembering when Jesus gave his own life for us to satisfy and settle the penalty of sin, which is death. Knowing that no one could earn right place and right favor with God. Knowing that forgiveness of sin could only come through the sacrifice of a perfect one, Jesus. He gave himself for us. So when we come to the communion table, we remember what he did for us. We remember who he is. And we remember that we call him not just sir, but Lord. Listen, this morning, if you're in a place where you're saying, I can't do this on my own. I, I, need, a, I need a Savior. Oh, this, this communion table was made just for you. That is who it was designed for. For the one who would say, I want, I need God. So I'll remind you again, the Lord sees you. He's, he's seeking you. And he invites you into himself, into the life that he will give you. But it requires simply this, that we would surrender to him. Let him sit on the throne of our life. I, those times when I've made those decisions where I went places I, didn't, I knew I shouldn't have gone or I said things I knew I shouldn't have said. Oh, I was sitting on the throne. Of, I was king of my own life. But Jesus invites us to say, would you step down and let me be your king? And if that's where you're at this morning, you're invited to take this communion because that's what it's for. We say, King Jesus, thank you. We remember you are our leader. I'm going to ask if our musicians would come up and if those that are serving... There'll be somebody, a couple people serving at each of the tables and somebody, if walking in a crowd is difficult, there'll be somebody who will find you and offer to you the communion elements. I'm going to invite you, if you would, could you make your way down the middle aisles and return around to your seats around the back? That'll just make it easier for the, for the flow of those that want to come and receive communion. It's not compulsory. You don't have to do it. But we invite you to remember what the Lord Jesus has done for you. I'll just say a word of prayer and then invite you in just a moment to stand and come and receive communion. Oh Lord, we remember, we thank you for the example of finding that man when he'd been thrown out. For seeing that man and seeking that man. And we thank you that you have come to find us and come to seek after us. Thank you for making yourself known and thank you for giving your life in place of ours for that penalty of sin. Lord, and that's what we call you today. Lord, we surrender our lives to you. Amen. I can't see you quite yet, but I'm going to invite you, friends, to stand and come and receive this communion. The body of Christ broken for you, His blood shed for you, knowing that He loves you. And you can take that at the altar or back at your seat as you're ready to do so. God bless you as you receive this today. God bless you.
you have not yet taken your uh, elements, then I invite you to do so, knowing this. You're beloved of God. He loves you. Lord bless you, friends. Now I have to admit, I thought when I washed my eyes off, you all would play a trick on me and have left. So I would... <laughs> And those of you that are now coming under conviction because you'd actually thought of that, you just come back to the Lord. You just come right under. <laughs> Do you know that the Lord loves you? He just does. You're, you're the apple of His eye. And He's patient with us. Teaching us how to follow Him. I want to uh, have a moment where we close our time together singing that song that John Newton wrote that comes right out of what that man said. I, I know this. I was blind and I can see now. Yeah. And you know that that's about the second sight, don't you? But I invite you as, as we sing this song to you can stand, sit, kneel. You take whatever posture you'd like. The Lord bless you as you worship. Because of T. Mike's generosity, we have extra mud, and I'd like to share it with you. I hope you know. I said it as plainly as I could. God loves you. No matter what the world tells you, he loves you. He's for you. He's not against you. He loves you. He knows who you are. He knows you by name. 
and He's seeking after you and inviting you into His life. So it's with great pleasure that I say to you, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make His face to shine onto you and give to you peace and rest. You're dismissed. The Lord bless you.